Hello everyone, my name is Brendan Snyder. Thank you so much for joining me and welcome to the top 10 best rock albums of the 80s. So with words like the best, the greatest of all time, these are some of the words that are used with the albums that we're gonna be discussing today. And so uh, these albums themselves are all career defining, genre setting, hugely influential and record breaking albums. We're gonna dive into that and break all of these down in just a bit. But before we do, if you're new to my channel and you haven't already hit the subscribe button, please click the button. Also leave a comment, hit like, all those things help support my channel. I would greatly appreciate it. And of course, as an added bonus by subscribing, you'll be able to stay up to date on all that's going on in the world of music, just like this with the top 10 best rock albums of the 80s. So now the thing is, there are so many to be considered here. And the problem is there just isn't enough room in a top 10 list. Case in point, I'm wearing a Bon Jovi shirt here and there is no Bon Jovi in my list. But I do have an honorable mention that I want to kick things off with here. And we're going to start with Yes, 90125, the 1983 classic album. It was their 11th studio album and went on to sell 3 million copies just in the US. And it was the first to feature a new lineup that had guitarist Trevor Rabin in the mix. And the band had retained its prog rock roots in this, but mixed in some modern elements all to be very contemporary at the time. I think that was quite a feat uh, to be able to do something like that after being uh, one of the biggest prog rock bands out of the 70s, featuring a classic song, Owner of a Lonely Heart. Just a simple sounding natured song uh, at its roots, but there's a lot of hidden flourishes and things within it uh, that has kept it fresh, I think, for the last or near 40 years that uh, that song has been out. Then there's the song Hold On, which is made up of uh, really two different songs within it that they combined that I think gives it a real unique sound. And then the song Changes, which uses an odd time signature at the beginning of this thing before breaking into a very beautiful melodic sound uh, throughout in this of which I think really elevates it during the course. And all of those things together with this album in and of itself is why I'm having it here as an honorable mention and unfortunately just falling shy of the top 10. But here we are now with the top 10 best rock albums of the 80s, kicking things off and coming in at number 10, Foreigner 4 from 1981, fourth studio album from the band, six million copies sold in the US. And the album sound itself has a perfect rock sensibility to it. It's got driving rhythms, riffs on this thing, mixing hard rock and pop beautifully on this album here. In my opinion, everything you could want from a rock album. It's got songs like Jukebox Hero on it. That's got a driving bass and drum intro on it that really pulls you in. Then you've got songs like Waiting for a Girl Like You, which has one of the most smoothing sounds to it that I've ever heard in a song. And then one of my personal favorites from the band Urgent. This one here, uh, the song itself, the structure of it matches the title of it. It's got an urgency within it. And it's also got a really amazing sax solo on this one too. Okay, coming in at number nine, we've got ZZ Top Eliminator from 1983 eighth studio album from the band. It would go on to sell over 10 million copies just in the US. The album sound mixes and updated electronic elements into it, um, but you know, it mixes it with their already classic blues based boogie that they had done. I think it's a perfect blend and mix for the styles that they were able to do for that era. Featuring Gimme All Your Lovin', which uh, Frank Beard, the drummer, provides an amazing opening drum riff in this thing. And then you get some silky smooth guitars from Billy Gibbons on it. Got Me Under Pressure has a really great driving riff on it and a chugging bass line from Dusty Hill. You've got Sharp Dressed Man on here, which is just an all out sultry rocker. And you've got Legs on here, which is one of the best songs in the 80s that was able to merge keyboards with it, yet still keeping a classic feel. I think something that ZZ Top did perfectly on this album here. All right, coming in at number eight, we've got White Snake's self titled release and or titled 1987, depending upon uh, which you know way you want to go with it. Uh, seventh studio album, 8 million copies sold in the US alone. One of the biggest sounding rock records of all time, in my opinion. Uh, it's got huge guitars, bombastic drums, and some really over the top vocals on it. Uh, completely changed uh, the direction the band had been going from just a straightforward blues rock band to the more pol polished hard rock band that had some blues influences in it. So it's a really kind of a 
a career defining album that made that final shift for these guys. The album itself did feature two songs that were re recorded from the album Saints and Sinners that had come out in 1982 Crane in the Rain, and on this one here, guitarist John Sykes really revs this version up here, making it much heavier. And then here I go again. This version of it is a more straightforward rocker than the original one that had a much more boogie type feel to it. But this one here almost begins to verge on the territory of a power ballad and whatnot. The album itself also features the songs Is This Love and this song specifically is power ballad territory and arguably white snake being the band that invented the power ballad uh, doing it better than anyone else in my opinion um, and then the album itself has the song still of the night which is another huge guitar sounding song from john sykes and of course david coverdale does some overdrive uh, with his vocals on this thing here that's just amazing okay coming in at number seven we've got motley crew Dr. Feelgood from 1989, fifth studio album from the band, going on to sell six million copies. And it was the first one that the band had recorded after getting sober. Um, they had a renewed sense of energy on this one that I think really came across in the recordings. They worked with producer Bob Rock on this, who of course would go on to even bigger fame working with Metallica. But he made everything sound really big and full, and I don't think that that can be overlooked in terms of the album itself. Um, it's just a solid album from start to finish. All the deep cuts are just as good as the the big songs like Dr. Feelgood, which is just a nice, gritty, sleazy rocker. Uh, the bass and drums on this one are right in your face like you want it. And then you got um, Kickstart My Heart, which features that iconic whammy bar guitar intro for Mick Mars and just a huge revved up song on speed. And Same Old Situation, which is a big rock song full of melody on this one here and one of my absolute favorites by the band. Okay, coming in at number six, we've got Rush Moving Pictures, eight studio album from the band, would go on to sell four million copies in the US alone. And the album itself melds the prog rock stylings of the band, but with tighter and shorter song structures than they had previously been doing. Uh, the album itself just adapted to the times. I think they did it really well, hitting the mark on each song, featuring Tom Sawyer, uh, one of the best song openings, in my opinion, with the bass and keyboards, the way they just hit and come in together on it. Uh, the solo by Alex Lifeson too, just simply amazing, making for a really powerful song all in one there. Limelight, uh, the opening riff on this one is one of the best in all of rock in my opinion, and it's the perfect driving song. I love putting that song on and just going for a cruise there. And then YYZ is one of the best all-time instrumentals. Having all this sort of stuff on one album here is just why this album is coming in where it does, because you've got just all-time classic stuff there with that album. All right, coming in at number five, we've got Journey Escape from 1981. It's the band's seventh studio album and has sold nine million copies in the U.S. It was the first album with keyboardist Jonathan Kane who came in and uh, gave the band a much more radio-friendly vibe. Um, it's got some real heartfelt vocals on it and emotion from Steve Perry. Big guitars from Neil Sean on here, emphasizing the music perfectly in this thing, and in my opinion, is a timeless AOR classic. Featuring songs like Don't Stop Believin', one of the biggest sounding songs ever. Uh, that piano intro that comes in and then the building guitar and the crash of the drums is pure perfection on this. Who's Crying Now with uh, piano and vocals paired nicely on this thing and then just accents from the rest of the band throughout creating a very cool melodic rock song. And then you've got Open Arms, which is one of the greatest love songs ever written. All those things, again, combining to place this album where it comes in. And number four, Van Halen, 1984 from 1984, sixth studio album from the band and uh, 10 million copies sold in the US. The instrumental opening that's called 1984 on here, so futuristic, even today, still sounding that way. And then it rolls into one of the most happy, upbeat songs ever in the song Jump. Next, we've got the coolest driving song ever with Panama. And finally, the song of uh, Big Dreams, Hot for Teacher on here. And the band itself, I feel, really invented the glam metal sound itself. But you know what? They do it so much better than everyone else, so much so that they were actually able to rise above that titling of the band itself and the music itself being centered around Eddie Van Halen's guitar techniques that to this day still have been unmatched. And for that, this album is an absolutely brilliant album. 
All right, coming in at number three, we've got Def Leppard Hysteria, 1987, fourth studio album from the band, would sell 12 million copies in the US. It's got amazing production by Mutt Lang on it, who's a key factor on this album itself. He's essentially a sixth member of the band. The band has even said as much, you know, for what he was able to do for this album. I don't think that that can be overlooked. Of course, regardless of the production, it's only as good as the songs themselves. And so you've got the band delivering on all fronts here. Amazing hard rockers, beautiful ballads, and some spacey epic numbers on here too, featuring a staggering seven singles came off of this album too, which were all big, including Pour Some Sugar On Me, which is just one of the biggest sounding songs ever. It's great for any part, getting a crowd going kind of a thing. And the riff from Phil Collin is just pure perfection on this. Then you've got Armageddon It, uh, cool riffing with some sly vocals on this one here and a chugging rocker of a song all the way through. And one of my personal favorites, Animal. It's one of the best melodic rock songs ever, not just of Def Leppard, but ever. Driving rhythms on this one and just some really cool guitar accents throughout and an album that represents a specific time, but somehow is still timeless, which is why I'm placing it where I do, coming in at number three here. All right, coming in at number two, though, we've got uh, Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction from 1987, debut studio album from the band, uh, 18 million copies sold in the U.S., arguably one of the biggest debut albums ever. It's estimated to have sold around 30 million copies around the world, and it's one of the dirtiest, sleaziest hard rock masterpieces ever. Uh, the band is able to somehow blend uh, rock songs like the Rolling Stones with the blues undertone of Aerosmith, all for one of the best rock albums throughout, in my opinion. Every song on this album is good, from opener Welcome to the Jungle, that's just a gritty hard rocker on here, to Paradise City, which starts melodically, but it ends with one of the hardest rock songs on here, and then Sweet Child of Mine that has simply one of the greatest guitar riffs ever by Slash. And so what really stands out though on this album is the song structure on here, where lots of these songs feel like they're compiled out of multiple songs. They're just that complex, making changes within them, bringing lots of character and life to each one here. Each song can kind of turn on a dime really quick, providing that uncertainty and sort of dangerousness that was evident at the time of release when this thing first came out. Personally, I don't think there will ever be another rock album like this one, in my opinion. All right, and here we are in the number one spot for the number one rock album of the 80s goes to ACDC Back in Black from 1980, seventh studio album and 25 million copies sold in the US with an estimated 50 million copies around the world, featuring some of the greatest rock riffing from guitarist Malcolm Young. Uh, maybe simple three chord rock on here, but it is done better than anyone else can. The vocals of Brian Johnson on here, you know, accentuate each song. And then you've got lead guitarist Angus Young on this thing who just scorches everything in his path with his lead work. The electricity on this album is just simply unmatched. Don't know if it ever will be, but I mean, you've got big rock songs on this like Hell's Bells, Back in Black, You Shook Me All Night Long. Uh, but the thing is, the album itself is full of radio hits, not just the ones that were released as singles. I've literally heard every song from this album on the radio at one time or another. So essentially, this album here is a greatest hits, probably one reason why the band has never actually released a greatest hits to this date. And it's the reason why this album comes in at number one. Enough said. So there you go, the top 10 best rock albums of the 80s. Uh, yes, this was very hard to narrow down. Uh, certainly lots of other bands could have been included in this thing here, and I'm sure you've got your opinions on who should have been included. So go ahead, leave your comments, let me know your thoughts about who you think should have been included and or shouldn't have been included, and we'll have a nice discussion about all of that. All right, everyone, take care, have a great day, and I'll talk to you all real soon. Bye-bye, everyone.